reconciliation. We're asking for reconciliation. Reconcile us, Lord. Make us right with you. And may the fruit of reconciliation be made manifest in our lives. That in everything we see, hear, think, do, and be would be a fruitful result of reconciliation. God, we don't want to be people who operate in divisiveness. We want to be people who operate in the unity of Christ. If there is any division that comes for Christ's sake, so be it. But may it not be our intent to do that. May it just be the result of your plan that does that. But may our hearts always pray for ourselves, for our family, for our friends, for our communities, for our enemies. Reconciliation. That's what we ask for, God. And so, Lord, I give you this service, I give you this season, and we give you this time that we would come in agreement with the very ministry you've given us. Minister to us, Lord, reconciliation in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. So uh, they're going to mess with the mic. Please bear with us as they do that. Um, I want to say this. I want to explain reconciliation to you real quick. How you doing? What's up, brother? God bless you. Oh, I'll give you a hug, man. You want to come in for a handshake? Let me see. <laughs> May the Lord bless you this morning. Reconciliation is not an apology. Reconciliation is not just admitting you're wrong. I wish it was that easy. I mean, it'd make everything easy. I'm sorry for wronging you. Reconciliation is not just forgiving someone for wronging you. Reconciliation is moving in unity after being wronged. Is that not what God did with us? Because he's the standard of reconciliation. We were the greatest offenders. Enemies of God, the scripture says. Yet God comes and not just says, I forgive you, and doesn't just require us to say, I'm sorry. He says, now come into relationship with me, and let's change the world. Come into relationship with me, and let's show the world what worship really looks like. Come into relationship with me, and be my display of reconciliation. I don't want your sorry. I want your life. So how does that now marry to us? Aren't we, too, supposed to be a reflection of that? Someone comes and they've wronged you, and you say, I forgive you, but I'm going to keep you at arm's length. See, if the person who's repenting is true to their repentance, then their change has to be trustworthy. Some of us in this place right now are carrying unforgiveness from previous relationships into godly ones. And you're keeping godly relationships at arm's distance. And they're not even the ones who offended you. You ever met that person, been that person? And God is saying, I want you to lay down all of the falsehood. And I want you to come into full reconciliation. I say, Lord, show me what it means to be reconciled. He says it's internally and externally. It's initially and continually. Man, we just want one time. We don't want continual. Continual confession of sins. Continual forgiving. Continual repenting. It's not reconciliation unless it's continual. Because we have not yet come into full glory. Amen. Amen. My mother-in-law came up to me this morning. She said, how are you? I said, I'm doing really well. She said, no, no, no. How are you? I said, you know, the only time we're not well is when we can't see past the problem. But when you could see past the problem into the hope that's coming, you can endure what's happening because you know what it's for. When you know what the hope is for, you can endure. Amen. Amen. But when you lose sight of the hope, then you fail to endure. You quit. And so today when we talk about reconciliation, the first part of this is going to be on falsehood. I want you to go real quick to Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. I'm going to read in the Amplified Version. Again, Father God, as I preach, don't let me preach in error. Don't let me preach in lies. 
Don't let me preach in falsehood. May only what comes from my mouth be true, be right, be holy and wholesome. I pray for your anointing to fall on this service, God, that you would take and subdue every part of our flesh, every tool of Satan, and that only the Holy Spirit, Christ and the Father, would reside here, that hearts would be inclined to give you glory, and that there would be repentance in the house for the sake of salvation. I pray for continual reconciliation, not just initial. We want the whole thing, God, not just part of it. So, Father, I pray for an anointing again to fall and break every yoke of bondage, every chain, every lie, every deception, and that only the truth of Christ would remain here. I know, Father, I'm not the only one praying this prayer, but there are many in this body who are in agreement with this prayer. And you said, where two or more touch and agree, they shall have whatever they ask for. And you also said, when we ask, if we ask appropriately and not inappropriately, when we ask according to your will and not against your will, we will have whatever we ask for. So we ask for the mind of Christ. We ask for the Holy Spirit. We ask for the impartation of God. And we ask for the freedom that the Holy Spirit brings. I pray this now in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Woo, glory to God. Glory to God. We will not be denied of that. Amen. Now listen to what the scripture says. I want to I open up with this because falsehood is a real thing. It's what we all got pulled from. We were all in falsehood. That's the hood I come from, just so you know. Not Southside Modesto. I came from falsehood. Amen. This is what the Scripture says in the Amplified Version. I love the way it reads. It says this, Therefore, rejecting all falsehood, whether lying, defrauding, telling half-truths, spreading rumors, any such of these, speak truth, each one with his neighbor. For we are all parts of one another. And we are all parts of the body of Christ. Be angry. Don't get mad at me. Don't be angry because I'm angry. You know what I'm saying? Be angry at sin, at immor immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior. Be angry at ungodly behavior. Yet, do not sin. Now listen to this part, what the sin is. Do not sin. Do not let your anger, which is against ungodly behavior, it's righteous anger, but don't let your anger cause you shame, nor allow it to last until the sun goes down. So you shouldn't be taking that into your sleep with you. It shouldn't be an anger that you're now fixated on because we have a mercy seat that's greater than the judgment seat. Somebody say amen. The anger comes because there's a righteous judgment coming against those things. But the peace comes when the mercy triumphs over that judgment. Amen. Praise God. I love the mercy of God. Don't let your anger cause you to sin. Why? Because you go down in your sleep in mercy. You recognize that God was merciful to you. Amen. And so how can you hold anything against any man? Listen to this. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. The thief who has become a believer must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, making an honest living, producing that which is good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. Now, real quick. It's not just for thieves because we were all thieves. Th this is an example of saying all liars tell the truth. This is why it says when you throw off falsehood, you're throwing off lying. Well, what does that do? A lie steals from somebody you're lying on. It steals their character, steals their reputation. It takes the focus off the fruit of Christ and onto the fruit of man. This is why even though you are angry about ungodly behavior, you should still never condemn those that are in ungodly behavior. Because God sent a Savior to redeem them. Did he redeem you? Then redemption flows through you. You feel the anointing of God in this place? 
Now listen, do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words, not just cuss words, words that are cultivated from bitterness, words that are cultivated, see, from falsehood. Do not let those words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need of the occasion, so that it is and will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own for the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Listen to this. Let all bitterness, say all bitterness, and wrath, and anger, and clamor, let it all. And I, this is, I love this part of the Amplified. Perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, and fault finding, and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence. Be kind and help to one, helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, and understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Somebody say amen. Can, we just go to lunch. We just go to lunch. We just end it right there. Zamora is about to run out of tortillas today. You know what I'm saying? See, when you realize that's what God pulled you from, you were bitter and you're no longer bitter. And if you got bitterness in your heart, God's saying, you're no longer bitter, you're just not there yet. Because when you were an enemy of God, he died for your sins. When you were stuck in the broad way, he was paving the narrow way. He says, throw off this falsehood that you come from. Lying, defrauding, telling half-truths, spreading rumors. What does it produce? What does these things produce? Holding a grudge, nurturing anger, harboring resentment, cultivating bitterness. When you're listening to somebody give you one of these things, and you still have those things, don't you feel it? Don't you give an ear to it because you have unforgiveness? Now you receive unforgiveness? No, people who operate in mercy know right away when the accuser's talking. But are you susceptible to the accuser's voice, or are you susceptible to the mercy seat? The one who comes and says, hold on, before you yoke up with the accuser, yoke up with the one who can truly accuse you but forgave you. A believer who throws off falsehood, this is what they do. They no longer lie but tell the truth in Christ. There's a big difference between telling the truth in Christ and just speaking facts. I'm going to show you that when I pull up... The, the scripture about the woman caught in the act of adultery. There's a truth in the fact, but there's also a lie in the fact. You understand? You can have the facts of a situation, but if it ain't built on Christ, it's a lie. If it ain't built on Christ, it's a lie. Only on Christ is it true. Only on Christ is it true. Somebody say, man, you know this is true. Only on Christ this is true. We don't tell lies, we tell truth in Christ. We don't defraud, but we live truthful before God and men. We don't tell half-truths, but tell the full truth in mercy. We don't spread rumors, but we avoid it. We don't hold grudges, but we walk in love. We don't nurture anger, but we walk in repentance. We don't harbor resentment, but we walk in forgiveness. And we don't cultivate bitterness, we cultivate mercy. I want to read. resentment, strife, fault-finding, and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, and malevolence. Be kind and helpful to one another, 
tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ forgave you. Now, is this church that? Is this church forgiving? Or are we resentful? If you've been in the fellowships, do you hear people, oh my God, can you believe this? Hey, uh -uh. y'all know I ain't putting up with that. You ain't putting up with that. Oh, but did you hear what so-and-so said? No, 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 no. All that whispering's from Satan. It can go over there. Because over here, we talk what's wholesome and true and right and compassionate and understanding and love. But let me, let me tell you something, church. Let me tell you something. Falsehood takes compassion and perverts it into pity. And if you got stuff going on in your heart, you begin to empathize with sin instead of what is right in God. You begin to empathize with things that relate to your woe is me. You got to be real careful about that. You're, just because you have the counselor doesn't make you a counselor. Can I just let it out today? I mean, I, I got to let it out. I can't hold back. You know, this church is real. We are not a fake, false church. We are built on what is true. There, we don't even need to defend that. Y'all can see that for yourselves. Christ is the one that met you here, not me. Trust me, you don't want Christ to look like this. This is You don't want Christ to look like this. <laughs> Say it again. I judge myself quite a bit. So. When we are operating in falsehood, we are driven by accusation instead of mercy. And I just think that as we look at this, what does this have to do with reconciliation? Reconciliation, listen, a lot of people talk like this. If you operate in this, you can't operate in reconciliation. That's works. That, that's a mindset of works. What that does is it puts a, a burden on people to say, I got to stop operating like this before receiving reconciliation. And that does not happen. You cannot be in falsehood and resist falsehood. Well, let me get right before I come to church. Let me get right before I come to God. Right? It doesn't work that way. God makes you right. Reconciliation comes in and then falsehood is put off. That's how it works. The lights come on and darkness flees. That's how it works. That's how it works. So reconciliation, in order to be reconciled, the first thing that happens to us is we, we stop lying. And we think lying is like knowing the truth and then saying the opposite. No, lying is thinking you're God in every situation. Lying is thinking you're in control in every situation. Lying is thinking you are at the forefront. That's a lie. It's a mindset that my way is trustworthy. It leads to destruction. You see that? That's a lie. So everything that's built on falsehood in the flesh is a lie. It's not trustworthy. But with that, when you the fruit of falsehood is accusation. I, I looked this up. Accusation says a charge or claim that someone has done something illegal or wrong. Now, here's what's crazy, right? Is it could be a true accusation. You ever had a true accusation with somebody? It really happened. So then the accusation is they did something wrong. A false accusation is that there's no facts to what's being said. But a true accusation is that there's actual facts to what is said. But the, the problem with both of those is that God has not ever, once in the Bible, ever placed Christians in the seat of accusers. There is a big difference of operating in righteous judgment and mercy versus operating in malicious accusation. And you could be 100% right about somebody in your accusation. Matter of fact, why don't we go real quick to John 8? We have to put off falsehood. And it's not what comes first, it's what comes second. So it must be produced in your life. You must stop lying. Amen. 
Right now, I'm just, I know everybody's hearts are turning over. Like, I've been lying about this. I've been lying about, we're going we're gonna to have a time of repentance today. We're all going to repent today. Because we're liars. Without God, we can't tell the truth. We'll lie to somebody's face, even in the name of love. I love you, liar. If you ain't got God's love in you, your love's no love at all. If you ain't got God's love in you, your love is temporary and selfish. You love because of what you get out of it, not because it's sacrificial. That's why there could be, quote, unquote, good people in the world, but absent of Christ, they're bad people because their good works, they get the credit for it instead of God getting the glory. Do you see that? It's a lie. So you could have the facts about a person, you could have the facts about something, but where's the heart in the facts? Where's the heart in the facts? Is it the heart of God? Come on, church. Throw off falsehood has to come with reconciliation. Don't get away from it. You want reconciliation operating in your life? You got to put away lying. Lying is thinking you're God. Oh. John chapter 8, let's go there real quick, verse 10 and 11. You guys know this scripture. It's very popular. The woman caught in the act of adultery. We'll start at verse 4. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now, what's happening in this moment is two laws are taking place. The law of Moses and the law of freedom. The law of Moses, which condemns you, and the law of Christ, which sets you free. They had to say that by the fulfillment of God's scripture. They had to say, what do you say? Even though they were trying to plot in their own way of thinking, if they were trying to catch him in something, they were actually fulfilling the will of God because he was about to give them a new law. Somebody say amen. You got to be thankful for the law of Christ. What do you say? They were trying to trap him using the law of Moses. Using the holy law, they were trying to trap Jesus because they're in falsehood. Was the law true? Was their use of it true? Was their use of it true? Hold on. Yes, because according to it, you must stone her. But was their intent of it true? No, because they were trying to trap Jesus. So today, it's the same thing. Anybody operating in falsehood inside their nature, the very nature of their sin is trying to trap the nature of freedom. That's the real war that's going on. It's not person in person. It's law and law. Law of Moses, law of Christ. This is the whole thing. We'll get into some of that later on in this reconciliation teaching. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So could you imagine that, addressing somebody, you trying to trap them, and then they stay quiet? Jesus! Jesus! Ooh, you know they was mad. They was mad. They were like, we'll stone him right now. You know what I mean? Like, they were mad. He doesn't say nothing, doesn't say nothing. And then he stood up and he said, all right, when it was time. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again. <laughs> you know, he just kept going with what he was doing. And, you know, people who are full of bitterness are like, ooh, ooh. They just, they don't like that you have peace. Because they want to steal your peace because they have no peace. Falsehood wants to take what is holy and demonize it because they're operating in it. See, this is why we pray for our enemies, guys. It's out there. It's your boss who's plotting against you so you don't get the promotion. They don't understand that God's using that to build endurance in you. You get caught up in the promotion. You, it's, that's not the point. God's with you. He's tearing off falsehood. Amen. He's throwing off falsehood in your life. He's teaching you to be true. Let me tell you this real quick, and as God is stirring in my spirit, you cannot be proven as authentically true unless you are lied on. 
you have to be tested by being lied on before anything can be proven as absolutely true. Because the things that are true are your, is your faith in things in God, not so much the things that are going on. So when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. What a wonderful scripture. Anybody who's in sin in this place right now should be rejoicing in your heart that you have an opportunity to come to Christ with your sin and he will wash you clean. The hope of salvation is at hand. And I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, you know what some of our problems are? This is what happens in our walk in Christianity and our, our pursuit of knowledge. We forget the time we came to Jesus and where we were. We lose sight of just how holy that moment was, and it didn't involve your righteous acts at all. And then we start pursuing Jesus, and we start kind of getting strong, and we get a little bit of knowledge, and we start, hey, yeah, I know a little bit now. I, I can explain things. And you start battling for position now in your own heart and with people and what you know and what you think you know. You'll even boast about your miracles that only God did. You'll, you'll, there's people who get caught up in saying their testimony. They were shot nine times. So what? It was God who saved you. Yeah, amen. They'll boast in how God did it instead of that God did it. And this is what we do. We get a little pep in our step, and then God goes, I love what you're doing. I love all the prayers, and I love the worship, and I love the things that you're doing, but I have something against you. You forgot your first love. Like, may we not forget where we were when he said, neither do I accuse you. Now, if Jesus says it, it's final. He never recants or revokes on what he promises. So when he said, neither do I, that was from now until forever. I do not accuse you. And guess what? I got all your dirt. Not just what everyone sees that you're caught in now. I know every idle thought and every idle word and everything that you got going on, yet I do not accuse you. Hallelujah. That's powerful. That's a powerful gospel. And we should not forget that. God saved you when you were not worth saving. Nobody was worth saving which makes it so amazing that he saved you anyways. If we don't remember, then we'll forget. And if we forget, we preach a different Christ than the one we should remember. We preach a Christ of holiness without that mercy seat. We preach a Christ of righteousness without that mercy seat. We preach a Christ of progression without that mercy seat. We start formulating a gospel that caters to us instead of him. What makes that moment so powerful is that it was all about him and it was not about her. If it were about her, she would have been stoned to death. She wouldn't have been reconciled. She would have been killed. And she would have went to hell for eternity. Righteously. Righteously, she would have spent eternity from God. At that very moment, her soul was separate. 
until Jesus spoke the words, I don't have cable. See, he was talking to the Father and standing in the way. Woo, somebody better know what I'm talking about. He was like, God was like this. I'm pouring out my bowl of wrath, and it's falling on all of mankind. Here it comes, adulterer. And Jesus said, it saved us. That's why we can't turn from that. The cup was being poured out. And it missed us completely. And we've been healed and redeemed because of what he did. Reconciliation. Who is found not in exposing sin for shame, but for freedom? Was her sin exposed? So then your sin's going to be exposed. <laughs> it's going to be exposed. It has to be exposed. Everything you're guilty for must be laid out entirely, shamefully. You gotta be. You gotta stand in that spot. This is exactly who I am. I have evil thoughts. I have adulterous thoughts. I have lustful thoughts. I have greedy thoughts. I have hateful thoughts. I have all these things. Yes, this is me. I am fully caught in the act. It must be fully addressed. And then Jesus goes, "But I forgive you." In that transaction is why churches are birthed. In that transaction is why people give up their lives, guys. In that transaction is why you go forward and do the thing that God has called you to do because it is such a great transaction that you cannot live for prosperity anymore. You can't just live for accolades. All of those things just vanish. The value of those things mean absolutely nothing. To the dust we came, to the dust we returned. You look at those things, they're just dust. But then you see what God has done. And you're like, I will turn over every stone, God. I will tell every heart and heart, everyone, about what you have done. And when you stop talking about what Jesus has done, and you start emphasizing what man does, you have lost sight. You have lost sight. Look, I could talk about false teachers, Joel Osteen, prosperity teachers, people who, point, I could do that, but I'd rather spend my time talking about the true teacher. His name is Jesus. I'd rather focus in on him because he will actually set you free. Whoo. What causes someone to become an accuser? It's offense. It says annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult, a perceived insult of oneself or standard of a principle that you have on yourself. So if I come into your house and you like white bread, and I come in and I go, hey, I'd love a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And you're like, okay, cool, I got it on white. No, no, I'd like it on wheat. They're like, how dare you. And my... don't like wheat bread. Peanut butter and jelly tastes better on white bread. <laughs> Who do I got with me? That's real. Some people are like, nah, bro. Wonder Bread? Oh, come on. I, mean, I was poor, y'all. Come on, man. You, you know? Or, or let's just, that's just a simple thing, right? Or I'm in a situation with somebody who believes smoking cigars, a couple people, smoking cigars is okay. I don't believe it's okay. But I'm not offended that they believe it's okay. But they're offended I believe it's not okay. Doesn't it tend to go that way? Does it tend to go that way? Let's just give some people some, some grace here. Churches that don't believe in piercings, right? They, they don't believe in piercings and you have piercings. Wouldn't you? You're the one that's going to get offended. Not really them. And they may not be right. That might just be their conviction. But it's when someone has a problem with what you perceive is okay. Then you become offended. You know, some people are lying and calling hurts different than offense. It's, it's the same. Hurts and offense are the same. You hurt my feelings. 
That means you're offended. Listen to this in James 2. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. That's the law of Christ. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. That's a guarantee, guys. You are going to be judged. Let me give you an example, okay? We're all before God here. Just use this water bottle. I want to show you what an offense is, what a hurt is. I go, you think I went, how does that happen? Because when you were a kid, somebody hurt you, somebody beat you, somebody lied to you, somebody used something innocent and hurt you with it, like their hand which is meant for love and not beating people. Do you know how many times I've been in situations? you got to understand, I, I have more encounters than most of you do because I, I meet more people. Do you know how many times I've been in situations where I've extended a hand and people flinched? It's happened. It's happened when I'm in public and I've been at bus stops. It's where I just reach a hand. They think I'm going to rob them. Or in the church, I reach a hand and, I, and I, I'll shake their hand and they're, and they're doing this to me. I'll shake their hand. and, and Like, let's say you're, you're me. You shake my hand and I'm going, or a hug, like, <laughs> why aren't they able to freely do it? Because they're carrying offenses. A free person, if we're cautious, we're wise, and we're not afraid. You're not afraid. Matter of fact, you will embrace getting slapped in the name of the Lord. You're like, I realize you all over the place. You got a machete, three-year-old, don't know what to do with it. You're cutting everybody's ears off, and you might cut mine off, but come here. I'm willing to lose an arm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm willing, I'm willing to be lied on. Come here. I'm, I'm willing for all your brokenness to be, be poured out on me. It's okay because I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be healed. And so when people walk in an offense, they become accusers because in order, to, in order to hide that offense, they have to put the light on the person who's causing it or maybe not even who originally caused it, but who they perceive to be doing it. One of the, one of the things that breaks my heart the most is when I actually uh, meet people who have been sex trafficked or been prostitutes or been molested, something in regards to sexual immorality like abuse it breaks my heart because when that abuse hits them the the time it takes to trust again is sometimes impossible sometimes they go a whole lifetime and they never trust again and it breaks my heart because you know that god can be trusted you know that god can be trusted you know what just happened when i said that right people go yeah but not man and that's true. You see, the fact is man cannot be trusted. That's actually true. That's actually true. Man cannot be trusted wholly, right? Like they're going to somewhere along the line fail you. But the, but the self-preservation is the false thing. The, the, the fact that you're trying to keep yourself from being hurt instead of trusting God through the hurt is the entire difference of freedom and bondage. There's many people who claim this reconciliation in Christ and this freedom in Christ, but they're not, they don't have that fruit that's showing that they're willing to get hurt again. They're not. I mean, immediately they're like, nope, God's not asking me to be hurt again. Listen to the wisdom of God. I'm going to let you think about this. God's not going to let me hurt again. Just think about that real quick. I'm going to take a drink. God doesn't want me to be hurt again. Then why are you hurting? Aren't you saying that from a place of hurt? So how can you be in a place of hurt saying God doesn't want you to be hurt? It, isn't that contradict itself? Then if you can admit, wait, I am hurting, saying that God doesn't want me to hurt, then what is it that God's actually showing me? He's saying, I'm with you in the hurt. 
I'm actually with you. I don't want you to focus on whether or not it's coming and going. I want you to focus that I never leave. I'm actually with you. So what do we do in this time of reconciliation that's happening in our lives? What do we do when falsehood is, a, is around us or in us? Like, what do we do? Let's go real quick to 1 Peter 3.16. Are you guys being blessed this morning? Huh? You, you know you can't, you can't do this. <laughs> you can't do this unless it's been done to you. Meaning you can't offer wisdom unless God freed you from some stuff. And you, you can't even take this message and live it out if you're hiding sin. My prayer this morning is that you confess your sins and live for God. Because if you're hiding sin, hiding intent, hiding things, you are subjected to deception. It's only by a clear conscience that you can really receive this and live it out. Matter of fact, I'll go as far as to say that you are going to be offended by my shirt today. Because when I was wearing my spirit and truth shirt, some of y'all are like, yeah, I like that shirt. But when I wear my old man shirt, I'm just kidding, not my old man. When I wear my golfing shirt. Or I wear my, my spring shirt, you're like, Tony, man, you look old now. I want a young, cool pastor. <laughs> like, all, all Isaac does is look at my, my whack case Swisses. These are not the best shoes. But he's like, why you wear that, man? Put on some, some, some fresh air ones. Or, no, just, but anyway, you, you get what I mean? Like, you look at and you judge. You see what's going on? You, you got to, in order to, receive, it's because you're sinning. See, when you're sinning, that's, you're critical. When you're sinning, you're critical of others. You're not honest about yourself. You're not. You're not. And let me go a little bit further. It's when you're hiding sin and not honest with your sin. When you're honest with your sin, God will keep you from being deceived. You'll, you won't yoke up with other accusers and become one yourself. Huh? Is that true? All of you know that you've been offended at one point in your life and you went to the friend who told you everything you wanted to hear. And you get a half truth and call it all truth. <laughs> Sorry, I just spit on you. but <laughs> Don't sit in the front row, guys. This is like going to Universal Studios. You're going to get sprayed. <laughs> it's holy water, brother. It's all good. <laughs> Listen to this, brothers and sisters of Christ. Am I talking to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Yes. Listen to this. 1 Peter 3, 16. What do you do when falsehoods around you or comes your way? What, what do you do? It says this. Having a good conscience. Pause. Clear. Good conscience. You know it's all before the Lord. You're, you're living honestly. You're saying, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And in that beckon and in that cry of saying, help me, Lord, he's helping you. And he's keeping you from falling away. Amen. I want to hear some people who have been kept from falling away. You know what I'm saying? That God has kept you. So that produces a clear conscience. It produces a clear conscience. It produces a confidence. You can now walk, drive, go do this or that, and you're not afraid of falling. Because you're not living with a guilty conscience. People who live with a guilty conscience are always afraid. Of, I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get bit. Don't touch me. They become a spiritual germaphobe. People be coming to me like, aren't you afraid when demons come around? Why am I afraid? They're darkness. Light pushes back darkness. That's the reality. But if I'm living with a guilty conscience, I'm like, oh. well, they're already on you, bro. They're already in you, sis. They're coming through the crack of a guilty conscience. You can't get away from it. There is no anointing there. But when you have a clear conscience, this is what happens. Falsehood comes your way or it's there, and you have a, a, a clear conscience. You know the accuser comes to you about you all the time. You're not a good enough Christian. Look at you. God, he, he, yeah, he blessing them, not you. Oh, yeah, the accuser comes to you all the time. But when you have a clear conscience, you can stand and go, you know what? Even if God killed me, I'm blessed. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, when falsehood comes your way, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And listen, it's not the kind of shame where you're like, ha, told you. No. It's the kind that 
turns them back to God. It's the kind that actually you're going, that's good shame. That's good shame because you weren't you realizing you weren't really doing harm to me. See, this whole thing was with you and God. Now, here's another part. What, what do you do? Romans 16, 17 through 18. And now I make one more appeal, my brother and sister. Watch out for the people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. I didn't say it. The Bible's telling us. Now, you guys know, real quick, pause. If you're at a job, all right, uh, Mike, you're a manager, right? I don't want to get nobody in trouble, right? But you're a manager. And he's a manager over a uh, canvassing team that goes and knocks doors to generate leads for salesmen to make sales. That's, that's his job, is to oversee lead generation. Now, he's dealing with people, dishonest people. If all of his employees were honest, he wouldn't get as many leads. <laughs> Y'all don't like that, huh? You're like, quit it, Mike. Get out of there quick. <laughs> no. If all of his people were honest people, he wouldn't generate as many leads because there's a portion of the leads that get, that get generated through dishonesty. I don't work there. I know people. I know they're lying. Oh, yeah, that was a great appointment. Oh, yeah, every one of them's a great appointment. Come on. Every one of them was honest and perfect. Come on. Every one of them wanted what you had. Come on. But this is true. He, he actually has to manage a group of people to do a job in an honest way when they're being dishonest. And then he's accountable for all of them. And if he turns a blind eye, then he's accountable for turning a blind eye. And the only reason he would turn a blind eye is if he himself were already turning a blind eye on himself. Now, if his people start complaining about Mike and they're dishonest on their leads, how quickly are they going to want to slander his character to protect their own. Beware. Don't be around people like that. It's not good for your faith. As a matter of fact, it says here that it causes division and upsets people's faith. It says stay away. It's not saying that there can't be reconciliation. It's not saying that there can't be love shown. It's saying that what does light have fellowship with darkness? How does an honest, clear conscience yoke up with a dishonest, guilty conscience? They, they don't work together. And if you just simply look at the fruit of your own life and the fruit of people's lives, you will either be able to see reconciliation fruitful or you're going to see a plethora of discord. That discord can come through from their childhood of never having friends. To always fighting their siblings. To never obeying their parents. To never staying at a job because they're never satisfied and they're always looking for something more. To divorcing three times, four times, ten times. And they don't have to get married to divorce, guys. They can have 50 relationships they never stay faithful to. And they can lead that and follow it into their Christianity. They could still be manifesting those things. And so we have to be wise when we're looking at the fruit of somebody's life. Are they operating in a clear conscience or a guilty one? Because the produce of a guilty conscience is blame, blame, Blame. It's always everybody else's fault. Church hopping, church hopping, church hopping. They never stay rooted. And even when I or a pastor or somebody actually says, you should probably stay put, oh, now they're trying to control. They're never satisfied. But a person with a clear conscience is able to actually discern wisdom. 
Matter of fact, a person with a clear conscience can even lis listen to people who are false teachers out there and everything and still take truth while disregarding the lie. They actually have a freedom they're operating in. Do you see this? And it's amazing to me that when the scriptures say such people are not serving Christ our Lord, they are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. And sometimes you need to remove, this isn't the scripture now, I wrote this down. Sometimes you need to remove people and other times you need to remove yourself. This is something that you have to do in your life as a result of that. Reconciliation manifests throwing off falsehood. When you throw off falsehood, you no longer accuse. When you no longer accuse, you no longer yoke up with accusers. And they could be accusing right. She was caught in an act of adultery. Stone her. Cut them out. Disregard them. Revoke their calling. Whatever you want to say. Disown them. They're no longer. And Jesus goes, not going to do that. You can remove yourself, but I'm not going to remove you. Y'all got to hear this word right now. You can remove yourself, but I'm not going to remove you. Because when I say I saved you, I don't need your word on it. I don't need your word on it. I put my word on it. And this is why when God has saved you, and you know God has saved them, and they could be like the Jews, totally killing Jesus, walking away, no longer holding to mercy, and you're still going, but you're faithful. I'm not going to curse them. You're faithful. I know you can redeem them. You can open their eyes. You can turn them back to you. I'm not, they're your chosen people because you said so, not because they said so. Isn't that amazing? So throwing off falsehood means trusting God. It's so simple. But you can't trust God when you're operating in the flesh. You don't. When falsehood is your driving mechanism, there is no faith. I wrote this down. True reconciliation with God through Christ results in throwing off falsehood entirely, cutting it out of your life internally and externally. We are meant to walk with people who have thrown off falsehood and not those who claim Christ but operate in falsehood. So I, I want to send this warning one more time. If you are hiding things, you are subject to being deceived. But if you're living openly and honestly, you are subject to being persecuted. Everyone <laughs> falls into one of the, those two categories. If you're hiding and lying, you can be deceived. You are already deceived. Because, oh, man, whew, glory to God. You're already deceived. You're already deceived if you're hiding and lying because you actually think you're hiding and lying to God. Like, you can't hide from God and you can't lie to God. It's impossible to hide and lie to God. Amen? So if you're hiding and lying, you're actually deceived already. But you're subject to further deception. But when you're living honestly before God, broken before God, open before God, repentant before God, all the time saying, search me, Lord, search me, Lord, search me, Lord, then you're not subject to being deceived. You're subject to persecution. Because there is an accuser of the brethren. And he goes before the throne of God. Can I give you some comfort? All right, some of us, we, we over-dramatize things. Because, you know, when you're the one being persecuted and you have pride, you're like, oh, my God, I'm the only one in the world. That has ever faced this kind of persecution. I mean, you're literally looking at a bloody cross, claiming this is an amazing thing, and then you're acting as though your persecution is worse than that persecution. Oh, my God, my mom's talking about me. <laughs> my sister, my brother, my friend, oh, my God, they're saying things that aren't true. <sighs> Somebody come feel sorry for me. Right? No. No. The beautiful thing about this is it points you to God. The whole point, and I love God's plan in this, the whole point of being persecuted as believers is we then get to take those persecuting us to the throne. So I want to give you, I just want to give you some encouragement. You think you're being accused? 
You're looking at your natural, the natural people, and you're going, I cannot believe you would say such a thing about a holy person like me, right? Like, I can't believe it. But if you can look past them and see that their actual accusations are nothing compared to Satan, who's sitting at the throne of God, accusing you. And if you can look past them and see that there is a holy work through Christ that's covering them. That God is actually covering the accusers who are under the oppression of the accuser. That God is actually working and doing something there, that he's not absent from his, his work. And especially if you've seen them confess the Lord. Especially if they've cried tears of repentance. And you've seen the hand of God on their life. You do not yoke up with Satan at the throne of God towards them. You yoke up with Jesus at the throne of God towards them. And you go, I know, I know they're a little off right now. I know the guilty conscience got them. I know whatever's going on, I get it. But God, all I see is your blood. That when they were infants, when they were babies, before they ever committed any crime against you, you covered them in your plan because you had them included in your plan. And if I don't see the redemption on this side of heaven, I look forward to the day when I'm standing with them in glory. Praising your name for keeping them. So I want to I want to close in prayer, but I, I want to take a moment and I, I, I left it with just a little bit of time because you know what? We all go through this. I'm going through it right now. My wife and I are going, where, where are the leaders at real quick? Uh, if the leaders can just the ones that are in our leadership, come up here real quick. Let's, those that are in this room, come here. Yeah, I want, I want the leaders to come up. I want you guys to see who's actually behind the scenes laboring in this church on our behalf. And it's, this isn't the extent of it. There's some in children. And also there's some that are here that are actually being raised up for leadership because they've been called. Amen. Mama and Papa, come up here. You're a part of leadership. You're just, you know, you've been sick and going through surgeries and all kinds of stuff. You over there sitting down. I can't believe you didn't walk up here. You're very quiet. There are pastors in the church. They're like, we're not. So they've been on a rest uh, because mom's been going through some health stuff. Amen. She just had knee surgery, just so she remembers. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So all of us labor in this church. It's not, you see me preaching. I know y'all be looking at me. You got to stop looking at me. You need, you need to look at what God has put together. And everybody here does life with lots of people here, and even some people that aren't here. Okay? We're not the only ones. But we all, since six years of being a church, we get persecuted. Every time I get told I'm whatever online or whatever, they all feel it. But I'm not the only one you need to have a relationship with. You need to go have relationships with all these people. Matter of fact, I would say, church, you should probably have a relationship with them before you come have a relationship with Michelle and I. And it's not because I don't. You, you guys know, right, I'll have a relationship with everybody. Y'all know, right? Right? But the truth is, if you're a person of a guilty conscience, you, you need to get with people who you don't idolize. You, you naturally, in this world we're in, this culture in, you put the pastors on a pedestal. And people just do that naturally. They just do that naturally. It's, I'm not saying that because we're anything. You know it to be true. We put people up like this. And then when you're a person who's going through some stuff, you, are a, you want to attach to what you think is that, that place near God. We're all near God. We're all near God. There's other people right here, brothers and sisters right here, who are not ordained ministers in this church that are near God that can help pour into you. And so we don't want to be a rock star church. Nah, we cancel that out right now. We don't want to be a church that, li that idolizes things. We cancel that. You know who we idolize? The Lord. And we idolize that in each other. And that's what you have up here. Am I right, brothers and sisters? I'm serious. Am I right? So what I want to do is, just so you guys know, so this is a, 
sorry. <laughs> sorry. This is, this is who God has chosen and has equipped to help handle this church and walk with, with this church. Okay? In two weeks, because next week, Dale's going to preach. He didn't know that I was going to be starting a season of reconciliation, and he had already been given a message on it. And so when I came to him, I said, hey, bro, I'm not going to be here this w- next weekend. Can you preach? He was like, yeah. I said, well, it's on reconciliation. He's like, it's all God, man. It's all God. So he has a, a message on reconciliation that's going to bless us all. I love it whenever our brother pours out, so I'm looking forward to that. But when I come back the following week, instead of going, continuing in reconciliation, we're going to just be a panel. And you're going to be free to ask whatever you want in regards to this church. And we're going to walk that out. Amen? Because you, you should be able to talk to more than just me hearing me preach. You need to hear all of us. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're just going to share our hearts. People will share their calling to the ministry, things like that. And we'll just have a service where we kind of get to know that part of what God has put together. Is that cool? Okay. Praise God. Amen. You guys can sit down. You guys can sit down. Isaac, stop looking so hardcore. <laughs> Some people are like, he's in the leadership. <laughs> Why is he mugging, man, in the name of Jesus? <laughs> Yeah, he's like, when he's serious, that means he's all lit up. Huh? He's like, <laughs> um, and I want to say, man, from the bottom of my heart, I thank God for the people God has put together here because it is a blessing. It is a blessing. Um, and I'm going to be vulnerable with you. And you could, you could turn the cameras off. I, I, I want to be vulnerable with you about something. Um, 